talk about this whole idea of busyness. Now, that is kind of a really typical response, right? If someone's like, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm so busy, right? We hear people say that all the time, like, I'm so busy. Everyone is so busy. And yes, believe me, I know that there are so many more demands on our time than ever before. And so um, we can feel and we truly can be really busy. But what I want to talk about tonight is helping you to really um, be clear and evaluate, are you truly busy? Or are you fake busy? Um, so let me start off with an example. This is an example I shared in my newsletter last week because it helps kind of put this in context. So I have a client who really wanted to um, have more free time. She wanted more freedom and flexibility in her life, but she felt like she just didn't have any time. She said, you know, I feel like my work demands are just over the top. My family's always calling me for things that are really like not that important that they could really handle themselves and she said I just have too much going on that I can't possibly seem to find the time to travel the way that I want or to you know be in a relationship and and so I'm like okay so anytime a client tells me the reason they're not going after their goals is because of time I know it's almost never true we can you know find time is finite right 24 hours in a day so you can't find the time, you need to create the time. So the first place I always go with clients is let's look at your calendar. Let's see what is currently occupying your time, whether you literally put it in a calendar or not, doesn't matter. But let's see what is literally occupying your time. Um, so when we looked at this particular person's calendar, it was like family demands, it was work stuff. And so as we looked at how we could streamline those processes, like, you know, there was inefficient processes at the office, so we helped her streamline some of that, helped her set some boundaries with her family, so they weren't always coming at her all the time, and taught her how to not immediately respond every time someone gets in touch, so she doesn't have to be at their beck and call, and retrain them to not treat her as such. And they actually took to it really easily, which was surprising to both of us. So after a, ser after a period of time, we were able to kind of streamline her life and get her that freedom and that flexibility that she really dreamed about. And so when I said, oh my God, you must be so excited. Like you have the, all that freedom you've been dreaming about for so long. We made it happen. And, and she said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And I thought, well, um, you don't sound it. <laughs> you know, you, you, your words don't match your tone. And she, she said, well, if I'm honest with you, when I think about having this kind of time on my hands, like, what am I going to do with it? And I said, well, you said you wanted to travel. And she goes, but who am I going to travel with? Like, my friends don't have the same kind of flexibility I do. Like, they work traditional nine to fives, and I have my own business. And it's not like I'm dating anyone. And, you know, I don't really, I don't know how comfortable I feel traveling by myself. And so once she shared that with me, I thought, okay. So the inefficient systems at work and the family drama that she allowed herself to get pulled into all the time were really good excuses, unconsciously, to not have to face the fact that she felt very lonely. She talked about how she had, how she was feeling like she had outgrown her friends, how um, not only were they, like, chronologically younger than her, but just on, like, a spiritual journey standpoint, they were younger than her. And so they didn't have a lot of the same interests anymore. So she didn't feel like she had good interpersonal connections anywhere and if she wasn't busy she would have to face that music right so now she didn't know she didn't know at all that she was intentionally protecting herself from the feelings of loneliness by being fake busy <laughs> um, she thought she was truly busy and it wasn't until and this is what's so great it's like when you have this dream and you can't know it's never a straight line between here and your dream it is always a crooked journey, which I, as a coach, find fascinating. It would be so boring to have a straight line to your dream. I love all the twists and turns because that's where the real magic happens. So had we just tried to carve a straight line for her from here to, okay, let's, um, let's have you just take a trip next week and not really deal with any of the core s symptom or the core stuff that was going on, she would have run into this again and again. She, it would have been one of those situations where 
She got a bunch of work done so she could go on vacation, and then she would come back to piles on her desk, right? It would be like, you know, the people who say, I need a vacation from my vacation. It's because a lot of times we're fake busy, and you don't have to have so many fires burning. But if you do, if you're, if you're someone who consistently feels busy, let's look and see how that might be serving you, even if it's something you say you'd rather not be. Um, hey, Mark, welcome. Sunshine, awesome. Cool, love it. Uh, yeah, so really thinking about, how, like she was using her busyness again unconsciously, but sometimes we do it consciously. You know, we can just do a lot of busy work. Like, like for me, in my business, if I am doing a lot of busy work, and you know that, that feeling of like getting a little done on a lot, but a lot done on nothing? For me, that happens when I'm not focused, when I'm not, uh, when I haven't planned my day, when I haven't given some thought to how I'm going to spend my time that day. I can flit around and, you know, oh, I'll answer this email and then I'll tweak this design and then I'll, you know, I can, I'll jump on Facebook and check some groups and I can jump between a lot of different things. That's fake busy. I, I end up, it's fake busy is when you end your day feeling like you did a ton, but then feeling like you didn't get anything done. You know, it's that sensation of like, man, I, I've been so busy all day, I, I would have sworn that I got a ton done, but you go to bed feeling like you didn't. Hold on one second, I'm a little distracted because I got a low battery message on my phone and I thought it was plugged in. No, nope, I got one right here. But of course, what I say, wires from hell, right? My life is a tangled wire. This is my clutter nemesis, is wires. But I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. Here's the problem. <laughs> I love the whole idea of, like, Bluetooth and wireless and all that kind of stuff. But then I get nervous about, like, how much crap is, like, traveling in our air with all of these wireless things and, you know, you read... You read studies where it's like not good to have like all this Wi-Fi shit floating around your house and all right there we go <laughs> so there's my tangent as I plug in that as much as I hate wires I feel like they're a necessary evil and really talk about first world problems right no kidding anyway dialing it back in um, so th looking at whether you are really busy or fake busy so if you, if you find that you do come to the end of your day and wonder, you know, what did I even get done today? Where did the day even go? Or, you know, God, I can't believe it's already 8 o'clock or whatever. Review your day a little bit and ask yourself, like, how was I really busy or was I fake busy? So I know for me, like I said, when I plan and strategize my day, I can be busy. But man, do I get shit done. And also, when I plan my day and I'm strategic about how I'm going to do things and when I'm going to do things, I get a ton done in half the time. So then I can actually have the afternoon off or I can start later. You know, I'm not, for those of you who know me, I'm not much of a morning person. So I can like let myself have a leisurely morning and get rolling at like 11 or something and know that I'm still going to get my punch list done for the day because I am planful and when I'm planful, I'm efficient. So, um, I always like to look at when I'm, when I am fake busy, so I know that it, it's an indication of me not being planful when I'm being like flitting all over fake busy, but I also need to look at, is there anything even deeper going on there? Like is being fake busy serving me? So this is kind of a silly, but obvious example. So when I, back when I worked in corporate America, there was, and we've all seen this and some of us may have even actually done it. You know those people in the office or the people you work with who just run around looking really busy, but they're not really doing anything? Like they're really just trying to look busy or important or um, or they don't really know what they should be doing, so they're just kind of like playing make-believe. Uh, that's, that, that's that overt, obvious, fake busy, right? Um, where people are just like, oh, let me let me look busy. Or, you know, I used to work with a woman who... Uh, who self-admittedly would, like, run to the copy machine instead of walk because she looked busier. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? 
So that's like overt, obvious, fake busy, right? Where you're just trying to like put on airs and try to like make people think that you're busier than you are because either, again, either you don't know what to do in your job or, um, or you don't really, you're not interested in doing a whole lot. There's a whole lot of reasons. The main thing I want to focus on tonight is the, the kind of um, unconscious, hidden reasons why we use busyness as a scapegoat. And so it's almost like its own form of clutter, right? When you are running around, you know, running from this appointment to that appointment, and I got to go do this, and I got to do that, and then I've got to do this. You know, you have all these things that you cram your calendar with. If you're cramming your calendar with all sorts of obligations and commitments, but then at the same time frustrated that your life doesn't feel like your own or that you're not making any progress in the things you want to be making progress on, that's when you want to look at, okay, if I say I don't have the time for my own goals and dreams, but I am quickly agreeing to every request that comes my way, you want to look at what's going on there. That's where fake busy, you know, it's not, it's not that you're not really busy, but you're not busy with the important stuff. So what is it that you are avoiding? What is it that you are, yeah, what, what is it that you're avoiding? Um, you know, if you think about what your goals are, I mean, most times when I work with clients, it's usually doubt that their goal is even possible, um, not knowing where to start or how to even start to pursue it, uh, and, yeah, f fear that they won't be able to succeed or accomplish it, and or fear that they will accomplish it and they won't be any happier. So. Those are the kind of the main things that come up for people when I say, what's stopping you? After they say, I'm too busy, I'm like, come on, don't believe it for a second. <laughs> um, whenever someone says, I'm too busy, I'm sorry. And believe me, I know people have very demanding lives, especially if you're juggling childcare and work and all this kind of stuff. But you can still look at how you can carve out the time for what's really important to you and make sure that you're not spinning your wheels on stuff that isn't. Um, I'm just going to pause and check the comments. Sorry, I just heard a cat. I'm like, what? Oh, sorry, I've got cat issues going on behind me. All right. <laughs> we have, um, this is another little side note for you. So, okay. I just have to protect my feet. So, we have a cat in the neighborhood who likes to come up and visit our cats. Not literally, but like they can see each other through the kitchen window and our cat will start to hiss and growl a little bit. Oh, she's going to beat you up. Sorry. <laughs> Melissa's trying to break up things. Um, so anyway, so that's why I'm distracted because we got cat stuff. Okay. I'm going back to the comments. All right, Kathy. Hey, Kathy. Love this. Exactly what I've been experiencing lately. I had the day off today and wrote a lot, but didn't get a lot done. Okay. Yeah. So that's a perfect example, Kathy. If you look back at your day. So you say that you wrote a lot, but you didn't get a lot done. That sounds contradictory to me, because if you wrote a lot, then you got a lot done. You got a lot of writing done, but it, uh, but it sounds like maybe you didn't get done what you hoped to get done. So maybe the writing wasn't what was on your priority list for the day, and did you maybe get sidetracked to the writing? Again, that, for me, would come back to the planning piece. Like, let me decide today what I'm going to spend my time on. Am I going to devote today to writing? Am I going to devote like two hours to writing and then move on from there. Like that sounds like it might be a planning issue, Kathy. So I would encourage you like for tomorrow or for your next day off, let's say, give some thought in advance to how you want to spend that time. And this is really important. Be realistic. So if you like, at, anytime someone says to me, I've got the day off on Friday, I'm going to spend the whole day writing. I'm like, no, no, no. You can think that. You may have you know, the whole day free from an hour standpoint, but from an energy standpoint, no. I've, I've done that to myself in the past where it's like, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to get all my content done, I'm going to write this, I'm going to do that. And while I have those hours in the day, I don't have it in me to sit there for that long or focus for that long. Um, so next time you have a day off, plan what you're going to do for about four hours of it. Break it down into those Pomodoro rounds that you always hear me talking about and say, okay, I'm going to start with two Pomodoro rounds on writing, and then I'm going to do two Pomodoro rounds on dishes. So I'm just going to make something up, something like that. 
Oh, more people joined. Hi, Shelly. Hi, Tara. Hey, Robin. Yeah, Lindsay, your favorite, my cats. My niece Lindsay hates cats. Who hates cats? I don't trust people who hate cats. <laughs> Sarah, they need attention. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Shelly. You're amazing. I'm amazingly distracted. <laughs> yeah, my poor kitties. So, yeah, so, so anyone else, go ahead and comment in the comments below. Like, tell me about, like, how busy are you? Are, do you feel like you're really busy? Do you feel like you're fake busy? Um, you know, sometimes fake busy can be a good thing. Not often, but like one example is, this isn't really fake busy. This is just um, unconventionally busy. So for example, one way I teach my clients to set boundaries with people is if they get a lot of like requests or invitations to do things like, hey, could you make cupcakes for the bake sale? Or would you be president of the PTO? Or hey, want to go to dinner next week? Whatever it is, um, instead of automatically saying, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, and then trying to figure out how you're going to do it, you can use the kind of fake busy as, you know what, I'm actually not available um, to do that, but maybe another time. So you might literally not have anything on the books that prevents you from doing it, but energetically and emotionally, you're not available, so you are busy. So that's what I mean when I say it's not really fake busy, but that's a really good way to set a boundary is to just say, oh, you know, thanks so much, you know, I'm not, I'm not available, um, maybe another time, or, you know what, I'm not the right person for the job, but I'd be happy to help you find someone else, something like that. So you can use fake busy to your advantage sometimes, but I would say eight times out of ten, <laughs> uh, my clients use busyness as an excuse to not go after something that they feel a little bit scared about or they feel um yeah if it feels if it's outside of their comfort zone like oh no i couldn't possibly do that because i'm i'm too busy you know saving the world or i'm too busy whatever too busy training for my marathon or what like coming up with excuses those are fake busy excuses because i would never train for marathon <laughs> For some people, that could be a real busy excuse. Um, but really think about, like, if you're too busy to pursue something you say you want to do, there's a good chance it's less about being busy and more about fear around pursuing what it is you say you want to do. A really quick way to start to um, soften that fear is to come up with, again, this, I know this sounds repetitive, but coming up with one small action step you can take toward the goal or dream you say you want to pursue. Now, one step, you're not sentencing yourself to anything. You're just taking one step to test the waters. You're dipping a toe in to see, how did that step feel? Do I feel ready to take another one? Uh, you know, if we if we try to decide from a distance, if we're sitting in our armchairs trying to decide if that step is going to work, you really can't know until you get in it and do it. So one small step does a couple things. It puts action behind your intention, which the universe needs to support you, and it starts to show your fear that there's nothing to be afraid of. Because with every small step you take, you make it really small, your fear sees that there's really not risk, or if there is something that's scary, you you have what it takes to uh, take care of yourself. So that, you, the, that fearful part of you starts to trust you more. So small steps are the key to accomplishing anything you want to do. We think it's big leaps, but it's because we think it's big leaps that keeps us scared, which then keeps us busy from ever taking those big leaps. Um, so let's see. Shelly says, I feel like I'm wasting time sleeping. Okay, yeah. You know what? I think that's really common, Shelly. Uh, particularly if it's like an afternoon nap. I would hope that you don't feel like you're wasting time when you're sleeping at night. Your body needs that time to replenish. But, you know, I, I for most of my life, have, have been someone who resisted naps. You know, really, I would say only in the last maybe six months or so. Um... If I'm working and I find that like my eyes are burning as I'm working or my head's bobbing, I mean, again, fortunately, I work for myself, um, that I'll stop and go, you know what, I can either sit here and fight the exhaustion and get nothing done, or I can go take a 20-minute power nap and then come back to it feeling much more focused. 
So now I err on the side of naps. You know, I think of my brother Stephen. He owns his own business. He's a CPA. He owns a financial firm. And many, many years ago when I was very young, I worked for him at the office and he had a couch in his office. And he was known to be a power napper. And I was like, how do you nap at work? And he's like, I'm more productive. Like, he didn't resist it. It was, I don't know if he still does this, but it was like, listen, if I need a quick power nap, a quick 15-minute power nap in the middle of the afternoon, I'm going to do it so I can show up more fully for my clients that afternoon. And I thought, well, that just is ridiculous, <laughs> you know. But now I get it. It's like, instead of fighting it, I'm going to do the power nap. I know that there are people out there, there might be some of you saying, I can't power nap. As soon as I nap, I feel exhausted. There's an actual science to it. There's a real science to how long of a nap is good for you to feel like a power nap. Um, because if you go over that amount, you don't want to go so long that your body goes into REM sleep. Because then you wake up feeling exhausted. So you just want that power nap time. And I'll have to think of... There's actually an app that one of my clients uses to help her determine her ideal power napping time. And she actually says it's really good. I can't think of it right now. I keep wanting to say Zazzle, which I know is not it because I think that's in, where you buy some things online. I'll try to find it and I'll put it in the comments of this so come back and, um, and check out these comments. Um, so yeah, so... Oh, Shelly says, I can't nap. It makes me angry. <laughs> um, so napping makes you angry or the fact that you can't nap makes you angry? Uh, yeah, so Shelly, if you if you want to nap but you feel like you can't, like you, you can't get yourself to fall asleep, I used to be like that too. And I swear I tell you, it's a permission thing. If you have, have convinced yourself that you can't nap, you know what, I'm going to try to nap but I'm never going to fall asleep. You're going to prove yourself right. So once I gave myself permission of like, yeah, you know what? I'm actually, I'm going to go nap. Now, when I go nap, I'll, I will lay on my couch. I'll put on the TV and I'll put on an eye mask or something that acts as an eye mask. Sometimes it's a buff. Sometimes it's my hood, whatever. But, um, and if I really find that I'm struggling to fall asleep, then I might listen to like some soothing music or something. Um, I have one little album, if you will, that is like my lullaby album. It's really not a lullaby album. It's a, it's a piano music that, um, I found decades ago and it just has my, I've conditioned my body to, um, respond to it as a lullaby album. So if I really have trouble falling asleep, I put that on and like 10 notes in, it's like, oh, that's right. This is, this is sleep music. So you can train and condition yourself to be better at napping. I was a resistant napper. But you know what? Just start by laying down, closing your eyes. If you don't don't fall asleep, it's okay. You're still resting, which is great. So, again, we're striving for progress, not perfection. Um, Sarah, I have days when you feel like you get nothing done, but it felt like you did a lot in another way. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, are you? Are, you want to make sure you're getting a lot done on the things that matter. You know, are you getting things done, a lot done on the things that matter? That's really the most important question here. So at, at the end of the day, when we feel like I was so busy today, but I didn't get anything done, that tells me you didn't make progress on the things that matter. And I want you to reevaluate how you're spending your time. So I plan my day, like I think I already have let's see my little notepad here. I know it's going to be backwards because it's Facebook, but... It's a very quick look, but I like pen and paper planning. I mean, I have a, um, a running master to-do list on my computer, but f as far as my daily planning, like I write, okay, Sunday, Monday, whatever. Here are the things that I'm going to do that day, and I keep it realistic. I plan it, I keep it realistic, um, and I try to decide, like, what's a real priority, what absolutely has to get done, and how many hours on that particular day do I want to devote to my to-do list or my ta-da list as you all know I call it um, and I try to keep it super realistic and and then I, I even prioritize things and so this is all scribbles because it was Sunday but see I've got the numbers there so it's like I make a list for that day and then I go through and I write 
number one, this is the most important thing, number two, and so I do things in the order of importance, so if I burn out by, you know, after a certain number of hours, I've gotten the most important things done. I've gotten the top priority things done. So, yeah, if you feel like you're not getting a lot done, you're probably not focusing on the right stuff. Um, Lisa naps regularly and had one today. <laughs> nice job. I did not nap today, but... Lindsay, I feel guilty when I nap that I'm missing out on things. Okay, those are two different things, Lindsay. So, you can feel guilty when you nap, but then you could... So that's one thing, feeling guilty, or you're feeling FOMO when you nap, the fear of missing out, right? So those are two different things, and it's not, so I guess it's first determining which one is the most one for you, like is it, if you're feeling guilty about napping, what is it that you tell yourself you should be doing instead, um, and then evaluating like how true is that, how important is that, am I just not allowing myself to rest, if it's more of a, um, the fear of missing out thing, then that's a whole, that's a different conversation of like, what what are you missing out on, or what, what do you what do you tell yourself you might be missing out on if you nap, um, and what if you are in fact missing out on that thing, what are the consequences of missing out on it? So you want to explore those things more too, um, that I'm not getting things that are needed. So if you oh you feel guilty if you're napping because then you're not getting things done that need to get done. Yeah, that's, I mean, of course, I mean, we all feel that way, right? But it's like, you have to be realistic about the demands you put on yourself. We all have a finite amount of time and a finite amount of energy. And so you can, you know, decide, like, similar to what I said, like, what are my priorities for tonight? And, or today or tonight or whatever. And how am I, you know, what am I going to do first, second, third? And then if I'm tired... I feel okay napping because I've done the top priority things. I'm having another wire moment. One moment, I've got to go to get another wire. I don't, just don't have to go get it. Just got to lean down and get it. Oh my God, if you guys could see the freaking wires that I'm surrounded by. <laughs> I got my phone plugged into my computer. I got my computer plugged into the wall. I've got my microphone wired up my shirt. I've got it plugged into my phone. It's, it's I got a lamp. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, Lindsay, so not getting things done. I totally get it. So, like, guilt is not a reason to not nap. Um, anger is not a reason to not nap. If you feel like you need to nap, just, like, I know it sounds crazy, but practice napping. And then... Just, you know, because, like, this this resistance to napping is its own form of clutter. And so the best way to find out what's going on with that clutter is to challenge it lovingly. So that's what I mean when I say, just go lay down and rest. If you don't fall asleep, it's okay. Maybe have a notebook next to you, and when the resistance comes up, you shouldn't be laying here, you've got too much to do, I'm not going to be able to fall asleep, I'm so annoyed. Write all that crap down. Get it up and out of your head. Um, yeah, I hope I don't have a power outage either, Annie. If I have a power outage, everything's going to go away. <laughs> if you see me disappear, it means I blew some fuses. <laughs> Jesus. Um, Shelly, I am not a good sleeper in general. Four to six hours max. I like your picture in the background now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I know. That is a painting that I did at a paint night. That Shelly, I was with Shelly at the paint night. I know, I didn't think I'd hang it up, but for now I'll hang it up and then I will donate it to a nursing home. Um, so four to six hours max, you know, God, it's just, I love sleep. <laughs> I love sleep. And it breaks my heart when I hear people sleep like only four to six hours. Some people I know can function on that fine. I am a zombie. Like I really, I need I need a good eight hours, nine would be great. So, I mean, I'd probably get, let me think. Well, it's not, I mean, it's interrupted because I got cats who want to eat at 5 a.m. and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I'm probably good with like a good eight hours. I'm probably pretty consistent around there. Uh, if it was uninterrupted, it would be like a good nine. Melissa, yeah, I need nine to ten, yeah. <laughs> 
Pamela, sleep is good. I sleep more than I used to. Yeah, and like that's fine too. It's like, you know, if you need to sleep more, sleep more. Um, so Shelly, you know, if you want to, if you would like to be sleeping more than you are, I say start conditioning your body. You know, because again, you have a real, I mean, you have a belief and you have evidence to back it up that you are a poor sleeper. That you're just not a good sleeper. So, it's like you have this belief that you've told yourself and you prove yourself right. Now, what if you were to start telling yourself, I'm a really great sleeper. I, I love to nap. I fall asleep easily. Like, I know it sounds ridiculous, but the first place you got to start is by reframing your thinking. If we, if we look hard enough for something, we'll find it. So if you keep telling yourself that you're not a good sleeper, you're essentially looking for evidence to prove that right, and you're going to find it by not falling asleep. So whatever it is, start by just shifting your language. Like, oh my God, I'm the best sleeper ever. <laughs> like, if they gave out trophies for sleeping, I would win. Like, you, you know, gold medal in sleeping. <laughs> you know, like really think about shifting the language a little bit. It, it sounds, again, sounds silly. It's the first place to start. So shift that language. Shelly is the best sleeper on the planet. Everyone's going to hold that vision like, oh my God, she's probably sleeping right now. She's probably not even hearing me. <laughs> Are you sleeping, Shelly? <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so I'm going to circle back around. I know we're reaching the end here. So if you have any thoughts or questions about busy versus fake busy, sleeping, <laughs> if um, you want me to wake Shelly up. Oh, she's awake. I'm great at sleeping and functioning off five hours of sleep. I don't like that, Shelly. <laughs> I don't like that. We don't want you to be great at functioning off of five hours of sleep. I mean, you, we don't want you to be bad at it either. But let's just stick with the, I'm great at sleeping. I love to sleep. I sleep with ease. Um, and then, like, really look at what do you need to set up in your world or your environment to make sleep, to make your environment more conducive to sleeping? You know, do you, what do you need in your bedroom? You know, do you, do you love your um, comforter? Is the lighting nice? Is the color of the walls nice? Curtains? Like, how can you set up a sanctuary for yourself? And like, yeah, just find ways that you can um, set yourself up for success with sleep or anything else. Everyone's homework this week is going to be to take naps. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, so I'm great at sleeping. So... I know we kind of got off on tangents here, but you know what? You know what I say. Everything is always inter interconnected and related. So I want you thinking about this week, real busy or fake busy. At the, come the end of your day, when you review your day and you think, wow, I got a ton done today and I didn't even feel that frazzled. Awesome. You must have done some really great planning and strategizing. If you feel like you're running around, you feel like a chicken with your head cut off, you need to stop and evaluate how you're spending your time. Because even the busiest of people, I'll tell you, I work with some people who are, when I think about the demands in their time, I want to cry. And yes, some of them, most of them are really legit. I mean, they have a lot of demands, family, work, etc. But I can always, always find at least a handful of things that I'm like, what? Cut it out. Here's the final tip I'm going to leave you with. This is really important. I want you all to do this as well. If you don't have a to-do list yet, write one. Just do a mind dump. Empty your brain. Write down everything that you're thinking of that you want to do or that you need to do. Dump it all down. Once you have that list, I want you to go through it and evaluate it. I want you to identify which things on that list only you can do and put an eye next to it. Like, only I can do this. For an example, only I can go to the doctors, right? No one can go for me, unfortunately. Um, so what are the things that only I can do? What are the things that theoretically someone else could do? And what are the things on this list that really just don't need doing at all? That's going to help you really determine if you're spending your time on fake busy or real busy. Because when you dump things down, you go... You know, why do I even have that down there? I don't have to worry about that. That's not really a priority for where I want to go in life and what I want to do. So look and see 
really identify the things that absolutely only you can do, that you truly can do, not that you feel like you're the only one who can do it. We all have things that it's like, yeah, it's easy to just do it myself, but I really identify the things that absolutely only you could do, even if you don't feel like you have the most supportive spouse or friends or whatever. I just want you to identify those things that could be outsourced, that you could ask someone for help with. That really is the first step, is to change your thinking from believing that you have to manage everything in your world. You don't. That's when you get, that's part of being fake busy, is when you assign yourself as like the manager of your whole world, when you don't have to be. So there's your homework assignments. Amy Conroy loves to-do lists. Yeah, there you go. So I want you to evaluate your to-do list, Amy. See, Amy, I know Amy. She's very organized. <laughs> so my guess is you don't suffer too much from fake busy, Amy. I think you're pretty damn um, strategic, planful, productive, and give yourself downtime when you can, even with the family. Um, yeah. You're welcome, Sarah. Anyone have any final thoughts or questions before we wrap up this Motivation Monday? Until next week. Again, please check the um, pinned comment at the top. Go ahead and sign up for my newsletter if you haven't yet. Check out my clutter course, the Hay House World Summit. Lots of juicy stuff. Those links are throughout the comments here. Um, and I want to see you here next Monday. Same time, same place. Thanks for spending your Monday night with me. Really appreciate it. And congratulations for taking this time for yourself. Like, it takes commitment to carve this out and be like, I'm going to make myself a priority, damn it. So congratulations for doing that. I will, let me just check one last time, make sure my, yeah, Amy, I'm not fake busy at all. I didn't think so, Amy. <laughs> all right, good. All right, everyone, have a great week, and I will talk to you next Monday at the same time. Bye.